It's uh, the Sunday after Christmas, and so I guess that means it's time for us to say Happy New Year. But that always makes me a little sad to have to say, because when I hear someone say Happy New Year, I can't help but think uh, and hear instead, Christmas is over. Because to an extent, that really is the purpose of New Year's Day. It's really the first formal reminder that Christmas, the holiday that many of us look forward to all year round, is gone. And there's a part in me, and maybe there's a little part in you, that when you get to New Year's, you think, really? Already? I mean, my Christmas tree is still up, for goodness sake. That's it? And maybe with a bit of panic in your eyes, uh, you, you start to binge on the final few Christmas cookies you can find lying around the house and the, the last of the Christmas leftovers before you have to throw them away into the trash in the saddest day of the year. And really, I think that uh, this is also why so many people get drunk on New Year's Eve. It's, all it is is really their inner child trying to cope with the fact that Christmas is over. Now, all kidding aside, uh, the problem of Christmas being over is even more apparent for Christians. Because if you think about it, we just finished telling one another and our families and a watching world that uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, became human, died on a cross, was resurrected three days later to save mankind. And we told people in sermons and in songs and in celebrations over and over again, and now it's over? Again? Again? I mean, shouldn't that have been, like, it? Shouldn't that have been, like, the end of history and God's plan fulfilled and everything's done and now we can go on to eternity? I mean, why should we get excited about another new year when the greatest event of history already happened at Christmas? Well, we just sang all these songs about Christ bringing peace on earth, but why isn't there peace on earth? Well, this morning we're going to see how God answers those questions for us in the book of Revelation and how he continues to work out his final plan now that Christmas is over and another new year is in front of us. A new year that ought to remind us that Jesus is coming back. That Jesus is coming back. Today is something of a New Year's message, it is. Uh, but it's also the first message in a new series we'll be going through in the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 through 3. Uh, and uh, in it, Jesus Christ gives seven direct messages to seven churches in the first century. They address needs within those churches, uh, but they also address uh, needs for the church all time and for the church today in the 21st century. We're going to be looking at each of those seven messages starting next week, but today we're going to begin by looking at the first chapter in those first eight verses of the first chapter. Eight verses that powerfully remind us uh, of the Lord and Savior who is coming back for his waiting church. And that's exactly where we're going to begin with our first point this morning, and that is simply to say that he is coming back. He is coming back. Now, the first eight verses of Revelation told us this three different times. Uh, note, first of all, the repetition of uh, the one who is to come, starting in verse 4 and then working through to the end of that little introduction in verse 8. Uh, but then we also saw uh, this same thing made clear in verse 7 in a quotation of Daniel chapter 7, which says, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. But again, we can ask the question here, why is he coming back? Why are there two comings in the first place? Why didn't he just stay the first time? Well, the reality is for us in the what's called the church age is that we live between the climax and the final fulfillment of God's ultimate plan. What the prophecies of the Old Testament uh, about the day of the Lord and about the last days uh, and about the Messiah, that what they didn't quite make clear was that the Messiah would not fulfill all prophecies in one coming but in two. Uh, here's just one example of that in a passage we looked at last week in Isaiah chapter 9, which says, To us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. 
He'll reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Well, there you have it. The child is born, and we talked all about that last week, Christmas, and this whole month. But where in the world is his government? Where's the government that's going to last forever, that's going to reign in peace and justice and righteousness? Well, it's not at all clear from prophecies like this that the Messiah would come in two comings, that he would need to come, die, be resurrected, and then ascend to heaven to await a future time of complete fulfillment. And that the time of waiting would be at least 1,989 years since he ascended. Which, by the way, it hasn't been 2,000 years yet. We throw that around because that's easier to say than 1,989 years. And depending on when you date Jesus' birth, a lot of scholars think it was like 3 or 4 B.C. probably. So if you just say Jesus died in AD 30, you come up with 1,989 years. So it hasn't quite been 2,000 yet, but, you know, close enough. So... Therefore, New Year's coming after Christmas the way it does uh, ought to remind us, even 1,900 years later, of the way the disciples must have first felt uh, when they experienced the first New Year's after Jesus Christ came in the first century. Because they knew all the prophecies, and they had all the expectations of those prophecies like Isaiah 9. And many believed that Jesus was the real deal. I mean, they saw him literally walk on water. They saw him resurrect some people. They, they saw him heal diseases. They heard his teachings, and, and they saw him challenge the religious leaders, and they believed. They believed he was the one. But then he died. And on a cross of all places, the equivalent to us of an executioner's chair. And then all hope and anticipation was rekindled again when three days later he rose from the grave. And they thought, now, now's the time. Now must be it. But then he left again. He ascended into heaven uh, and told them to wait a little longer until he comes again. Comes again? After so many thousands of years of waiting in the Old Testament, he finally comes at Christmas and then tells his people to wait for him to come again. And this is exactly the situation that we have always lived in inside of, a time in between the initial fulfillment of the first coming and the anticipation of final fulfillment in the second coming. So when another new year rolls around, we ought to feel a sense of disappointment. Another year? I mean, we've had 1,989 of them. Another one? Lord, what are you waiting for? How many more of these new years is it going to take? I've heard this illustration before in a different context, but it's, I think, a pretty good one in in this context, too, that we're like passengers on an airplane that know we've been told it's going to crash, we believe the message, and we're given a parachute, and we put it on. We're we're wearing the parachute. But we don't know when it's going to happen, and we're on a very long flight. And in the meantime, you know, wearing a parachute is, is kind of uncomfortable and awkward and looks pretty goofy, even though this model is trying his best <laughs> to pull it off. <laughs> it looks so, so goofy. And, and not knowing how long the plane will be flying is a bit troubling for us. Always sitting on the edge of your seat, wondering, uh, is, is this a bit of turbulence? Is this it? Is this going to be it? And then nothing happens. And then the next thing happens and, and nothing happens. And at times, perhaps we get comfortable, we sit back in our chair only to feel the parachute and once again remember and clutch on tight to it, this plane is going to crash. And then we try to tell other people who have never seen a plane crash to put on a parachute. All they can do is look at us and laugh and say, I'm not, I'm not putting that thing on. We've been given this parachute in Christmas in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ at his first coming, but... We're waiting until he comes again to use it or until he takes us in our own passing. This tension is the same kind of thing that we feel at the loss of a Christian loved one where we know that that he or she is in eternity with Christ and and they are uh, living it up and, and that one day we will be with him or with her and the Lord but in the meantime, we feel the tension between anticipation and and 
fulfillment. Their eternity with the Lord has been fulfilled, but we're left here in anticipation of our own. We still feel the loss of their presence. We see the grave holding their lifeless body. We have fading memories of their life while they're rejoicing and partying it up in heaven. And we long so deeply to see them again, and, and, and each new year has partly been just another year of waiting to be with them, to have finally fulfilled for us what is already fulfilled for them. The first coming of Christ did not fulfill all the prophecies about Christ, and as a result, we are still waiting for the Lord to come back. Our lives can be characterized by the strange tension we feel between Christmas and New Year's, between the first coming and the second coming. But Revelation 1 draws our attention to that second coming, beyond the tension that we feel, to ask questions like, well, what does it mean that he's going to come again? What, what is going to happen? How is Christ going to come? What should we be ready for? What should we be expecting? Well, there are three uh, emphases of the second coming in our text this morning that we're going to look at. The first two tell us uh, what Christ is going to do when he comes, and the last with when he's coming back. The first two with what, and the last with when. So let's begin uh, with what. And our second point, or first point here, is that he is coming back, but he's coming back to rule. He's coming back to rule. Notice uh, back in the passage, the description of Jesus given in verse 5 includes the phrase, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Notice also verse 6 declares uh, to Jesus, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Thus, Jesus is now the supreme ruler of the earth who is due all glory and power forever and ever. And he will come down to establish his rule over all the so-called kings of the earth. He, in fact, rules with the authority of the Father and is equally due the title in verse 8 of the Alpha and the Omega, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. Just as Isaiah 9 predicted, the government will be on his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We see the same thing powerfully predicted in Philippians 2 when it says of Jesus, therefore God gave him the name, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus is not coming back as a baby in a manger. Uh, He's not coming into Jerusalem riding a donkey this time. Uh, He'll not be handed over to the religious leaders. He's not going to be handed over to the authorities. He's certainly not going to die on a cross again. He won't be crucified. He's coming this time to rule. And there's one verse in chapter 1 here that calls our attention to a pretty tragic reality of Jesus' rule when he does return. It's a quotation of Zechariah 12, which says that all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Will mourn. Why? Because they're going to see the one whom they have pierced. Now, this seems a bit strange to say because it was only the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders who handed Jesus over that pierced him, right? But here the reality is that those soldiers and and those religious leaders and even the disciples who abandoned Jesus, they stand as representatives for all mankind. The phrase here, all the peoples, means Uh, all the peoples of every nation, language, and culture. The reality is that all mankind is culpable in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Every one of us has put Jesus on the cross in our own sinful acts of rebellion. 
Thus, when all mankind sees the one, they have pierced by their rebellious sins. Coming on the clouds to rule, they will mourn because they realize that they will be under that king's judgment. And all should mourn because all have rejected him. Humanity, us included, we stand together as the Jewish crowd yelling, crucify him. As the Roman soldiers who literally nailed him to the cross. And as Adam and Eve did back in the garden, joining with the serpent in rebellion against God's rule for us. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming back to rule. And his rule will mean mourning for those who reject him and find themselves on the wrong side when he returns, on the side of those who are guilty of crucifying the Lord. But his rule is not only a rule of judgment. It is a rule of judgment, but that is not where it ends. If so, uh, we would all mourn at his coming and hope that he delays it as long as possible. But this brings us to our third point, and that is this, that he's coming back with grace and peace. He's coming back with grace and peace. After John's introduction in the first three verses of chapter 1, the very first words of the revelation of Jesus Christ from God the Father are grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. There's no sweeter words that could come from the mouth of God than these, the mouth of the one who will rule than these, grace and peace to you. This is why the one who reads the words of this prophecy and those who hear it and take it to heart can be called blessed. Blessed. Not cursed, not condemned, but blessed. But, but how can God say this of people who, who stand with all the peoples of the earth who have pierced the Almighty Lord? Well, we can be blessed to hear the words of this prophecy and know that his words of grace and peace are for us because of verse 6, which tells us that to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, we can be part of this group that even though we have all participated in the piercing of Jesus Christ, it's this very piercing on the cross that was always intended by God to be the thing that frees us from our sins. That his death was purposefully ordained by the Father as a, as a satisfactory judgment for our sins. But only for the sins of those who trust in the atonement of Christ on the cross, only for those who have repented of those sins and, and uh, surrendered ourselves to his salvation. Only for those who today bow the knee before Christ as Lord and as Savior. And this grace and peace from God and with God makes us a part of God's kingdom, uh, get, grants us the privilege of serving God our Father. It gives us the privilege of knowing that He loves us and that love was shown uh, most powerfully in the crucifixion which was done at our own hands, but for those who believe was done at the hands of our loving Heavenly Father so that He could say, grace and and peace to you, to you who believe. And it's this grace and peace from God that will make Jesus' rule a rule of great blessing rather than a rule of judgment for us. We can know that we're on his side. We can know that we have been washed by his blood through faith in Christ and that those who belong to him in his kingdom uh, will want to see Jesus return, will, will want to see him reign and make us part of his kingdom we want to see complete justice and truth and righteousness and wisdom reign in this world we want to see the end of injustice we want to see the end of evil and theft and deceit we want to see the end of uh, abortion uh, we want to see the end of uh, the war on our families through the sexual immorality of our culture and our legislative policies we want to see the end of the, the countless twisted idolatries of the one true God. We want to see the end of fear at uh, proclaiming the name of the one true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we want to live in, in a world where every decision from the government is an occasion for celebration, where every person is hungry to know God more, where every job and task is a worthy one for the glory of the Lord. 
and where we finally see the best of this world and the best of ourselves as we and it was meant to be. Time is coming when what the angel declared on Christmas to those shepherds will become finally fulfilled. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This is what every New Year's ought to remind us of. Just as Christmas reminded us to look back at the birth of Christ and the cross of Christ, New Year's reminds us to look ahead to the second coming of Christ, to to look ahead to everything being made right, everything God promises coming true. So say Happy New Year's, uh, but know that it's only a Happy New Year's because Christ is coming back. So Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back to rule, but he's also coming back with grace and peace for those of faith. But there's one more emphasis in uh, the passage that we dare not pass up, and it is this, and it tells us when he's coming. He's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. Note verse 1. Uh, the very first verse of this passage, which sets the tone for the whole book of Revelation by saying this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And then again, in uh, the conclusion of John's small introduction in the first three verses of Revelation, he says this, he says, uh, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because... The time is near. Now, right away, we probably are asking ourselves, well, how in the world can you say soon when this was written 1,900 years ago? I mean, isn't this a proof, you Christians, that this is all just a bunch of garbage? I mean, isn't this proof that it doesn't really come true? It's just a fairy tale? It's just nonsense? 1,900 years! And you say soon. Well, to understand this and the the teaching of Scripture about the second coming, I think we have to go to a couple other passages here to kind of help understand what is meant. We go back to what Jesus himself said in Matthew 24 when he said, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, this and other passages uh, teach the unpredictable nature of Christ's second coming. And here in Revelation, we are taught the nearness of Christ's coming. And from these two teachings, it's unpredictability and its nearness, we get the doctrine of what's called the imminent return of Christ. And the imminent return of Christ teaches that Jesus could come at any time in the future. It also teaches that Jesus Christ could have come at any time in the past after he was ascended to heaven. And this doctrine uh, matches well with other passages of, of Scripture that call the time period after the first coming of Christ, the last days during the church age. Uh, This whole period of time is the last days. It's not just referring to the very end last days. Thus, we can easily say that Christ is coming soon, even though it has been 1,989 years since Christ ascended to the throne in heaven. Uh, We can believe that Jesus could come and will come when he comes, at any moment, like now, or maybe now, you know, maybe not. I always thought that'd be cool if that actually happened during that part of the message, you know, like now, but no. And this morning, I was talking with uh, Deanne. She gave us a prayer request from uh, a lady that she watches. She cares for people in home as a, a home uh, help nurse. And uh, this lady was on her deathbed. She was in hospice care. And Deanne had a heart to share the gospel with her. And she, and she did. She got to share the gospel with her a few times. The last time she did, um, uh, Patricia is her name, uh, she was, you know, starting to slip a bit. And Deanne was talking to her and said, 
uh, you know, do you, do you remember what we talked about yesterday? And she looked kind of like, uh, I don't know. Do you remember uh, me being here? She's like, uh, I don't know. And she said, well, you remember we talked about Jesus? And right away, Patricia jerked, and she said, is he here? <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. But, but that's exactly the point. Uh, Patricia did trust in Christ, and Jesus did take her home. And for us, we are waiting that he could come even now. This doctrine of Christ's imminent return, it, it also guards us. It guards us from the many, many false predictions of Christ's coming. And every decade, there's several. Uh, the doctrine of uh, Christ's imminent return teaches us that we can never predict it, never predict it. And the simple truth is that because Christ's return is imminent and unpredictable, uh, it, it will never be known by us until it happens. We can look to another passage in Matthew 24 to, to understand this a little clearer, which says that Jesus says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, this is one of the passages that is often used to say that uh, the world is coming to an end soon because of a supposed increase in wars and famines and earthquakes and rumors of wars and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. But, but if you look at the passage again, notice what Jesus says about these things. But see to it that you are not alarmed. There's a not in there. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Some of your translations say, but the end is not yet. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, when uh, Laura, Laura and I, but Laura, had our first child, Emma, uh, I reacted uh, just like the stereotypical, you know, first-time father. And uh, Laura was having contractions in the morning, and we, we were... Uh, on edge. We were, you know, a little panicky. She stayed home. I went to church. She called me back and said, they're, they're still happening more, and I left church. I wasn't in the middle of a sermon, but I, I left church. We got in the car. We drove to the hospital, you know, speed racer all the way, getting in to the, the hospital, waiting for them to check us in and all these things, and I'm thinking, come on, we're going to have a baby, a and then got in the room, got ready, and we waited. We waited some more. I guess I could have stayed at church. <laughs> and, and about nine hours later, right? About nine hours later, Emma comes. The beginning of birth pains, are, they're just the beginning. Uh, and typically, uh, there's many, many hours still to come. That's what Jesus calls all these famines and earthquakes and whatever else. These are just the beginning. These are normal during this time. However, if the return of Christ as supreme ruler and king of kings could happen at any moment, there is one very alarming question we must ask, and we must ask now, both for ourselves and for others that we care very dearly about, a and that is this, are you one who will be blessed when Christ comes? Blessed to hear this prophecy. Blessed to know that the time is near. Or will you be one of those who mourn, who see with your own eyes when he comes, coming on the clouds to rule, and you know he's the one you have rebelled against. And there's no time left. C.S. Lewis has an excellent quote about this very thing in his book, Mere Christianity. It's a bit of a long quote, but uh, C.S. Lewis has quite a way with words. I think you'll really enjoy this. Plus, uh, last week my sermon was way, way short, so I got to make up for it somehow this week. So here, here we go. Uh, he's answering a question in his book about those who ask, where is he? Where has he been? It's been 1989 years. Where is this God you talk about? Well, C.S. Lewis said, uh, why is God landing in this enemy-occupied world in disguise and starting a sort of secret society to undermine the devil? 
Why is he not landing in force, invading it? Well, Christians think he is going to land in force. We do not know when. God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade, all right, but what is the good of saying you were on his side then when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, something that never entered your head to conceive, comes crashing in? Something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left. For this time, it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There's no use saying you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment, is our chance to choose the right side. So ask yourself, ask others, which side are you standing on? People need us as Christians to do much more, and you need me as a pastor to do much more than point back at the baby Jesus lying in a manger. People need us to point ahead to a coming victorious Lord, a king who will right all wrongs, who will finish God's plan, and will, who, who will put an end to evil and sin and corruption, both in the world and in us. A baby Jesus may be much less threatening for us to share with people, but Jesus, the Lord and coming King, is who we must share with people. The world is all too willing to keep Jesus in a manger uh, supposedly harmless and, and small, but we know that he is the Lord. We know that he is coming to rule and to confront the world in its sin. And we know that he's coming with grace and peace for those who trust in Christ as Savior. So love people enough to tell them that their time is limited, to tell them that the promise of a new year is temporary. It's temporary because we only have so many of them left. And Christ is coming again. Tell others to put on that parachute. To trust in their Savior and ours. Happy New Year. Perhaps to help us remember these things, when we hear that phrase, Happy New Year, we should maybe add a little bit to it. Perhaps when you hear Happy New Year, we should say something like, Come, Lord Jesus. Uh, let's practice, yes? So, Happy New Year. I got this side. Happy New Year. Oh, they said Happy New Year. No, let's try it again. Happy New Year. So, which is it that will be true of us in 2020 and for the end of 2019? Will we be blessed to know why a new year ought to be happy and that Jesus Christ uh, is coming for us? Or will we be those who mourn when he comes? Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that you have come. Uh, you sent your Son to us, our Savior. You sent him at Christmas, but you sent him with the promise and the hope that he will come again, and that when he comes, there will be no more chances. There will be no more sin. Evil will be put aside and he will rule. Thank you that we have a message to give to others and you have been so patient 
to give more and more people the opportunity to hear grace and peace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that, Lord, we believe, I believe, that Jesus, you did die on the cross for my sins, that your sacrifice alone washes them away, that I might stand in your presence and not grovel uh, in, in fear of judgment. And that you, three days later, rose from the grave to give me every anticipation and hope that I will have eternal life and victory over death itself. And that I will be a part of your kingdom for all eternity. I believe. Help us, Lord, to share this message with others, to look at a new year and to point people beyond it uh, to an eternity that awaits us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.